Yep. I, I am mostly going to talk about the composition and metamorphic history of the Beaver Dam Mountains. And I know some of you are set in your ways, but hopefully I'll convince some of you that metamorphic rocks are really, really cool. Like this, um, these are garnet rich leucogranites. We'll talk more about them. Um, so the Beaver Dam Metamorphic Complex is one of only four metamorphic complexes in Utah. And it is the only one in the southern third of Utah, uh, down here in the very southwest, close to St. George. And in most mapping that's been done, it appears just as a big brown blob. So, and we have, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. So the first thing that needs to be done is classifying the composition of the rocks. Um, so our main questions that I'm going to address are what are the compositions, textures, and protoliths of the complex, and what are the metamorphic complexes that, uh, metamorphic conditions that the complex has passed through. Uh, first of all, lithologies, we've got various different rock types here. Um, the a main summary of the body is something like this. We have a non-foliated rock rich in quartz and feldspar, uh, truncated with really foliated, folded, twisted um, rock that's more mica-rich, being truncated by the non-foliated rock. Uh, that the non-foliated rock we've interpreted as an orthomice, or a meta-igneous rock. It has quartz and k-feldspar, biotite, plagioclase, and garnet. Um, it, uh, most often it doesn't look as good as this. It's, it's more deformed. We'll get to that. We also have, particularly in the north, a more foliated, finely layered, um, finely layered gneiss that is, has been interpreted as a metasediment or a paranice uh, from sedimentary origin. Um, possible protolith for this rock would be turbidites. Turbidites are clastic sediment that, that goes down underwater and it's finely layered with more, um, more coarse, grained, coarse grained rock and more fine grained rock and that's what we find in this paradise. We have more quartz and feldspar, more coarse grained layers with thin mica rich layers. Uh, we also find lots of myelinites in the rock. Myelinites are basically uh, a metamorphic rock that's formed by ductile deformation, characterized by large shear strain. It's a rock being stretched out. It's characterized, like Jake mentioned, by grain size reduction. Here we see again the quartz going, becoming smaller and smaller in size. Um, it's really characteristic in thin section. This is under plain polarized light. These are K feldspar porphyroclasts, um, which means uh, they were they were there before the deformation. These these could be both. Um, they were there before the deformation. Now they're being stretched out and rotate rotated. We can tell the we can tell the direction that they're being rotated. Here's a K feldspar porphyroclast and a garnet porphyroclast. Um, other myelinitic fabrics we see are imbricated mica fish. Um, biotite, when it's stacked up like this, shines in the light, and that's why it's called fish. We can see these brown, brown books are the imbricated micas. Um, we also have, like Jake's picture, uh, quartz ribbons, quartz being really stretched out and deformed uh, around these K feldspar porphyroclasts. Um, Interesting things about the composition of the myelinites. These red books are biotites, and often they're not this red. The red is an indication of high titanium, uh, which means high temperatures. So these, these biotites could be formed from prograde or increasing temperature metamorphism. Um, and they're folded and shortened really interesting ways. The other thing we see is, is Perthite or flame structure in perthite. This is microcline, a type of K feldspar with with tartan plaid twinning. And when, as it's being stretched out and deformed, the albite, the white stripes, are exalted out of it and stretched out. So that's an indication of myelinization and strain. Um, we also see garnet-rich leucogranite. Um, 
Luco meaning white, so it's quartz and kefeld are really white with really big garnets in them. Um, we see this at various scales, either huge dikes or smaller scales. Uh, we also see late stage pegmatite dikes, which can be totally quartz or have lots of really pink kefeld spar. They appear like this in cross section. Um, there are lots of migmatites in this rock. A migmatite is a rock that is partially melted. Um, and here there are three parts that are important that we need to talk about, a leucosome, melanosome, and paleosome. Leucosome is the part of the rock that melts. It's leuco, meaning light in color, because the more felsic material, lower temperature minerals, melt first. The melanosome is the dark stuff, what's left behind from the melt. And the paleosome has been unaffected. Um, by the melt. So uh, here, here's a good example where we can possibly see all three of these. The lighter blobs would be the leucosomes, what's melted. The black would be the melanosome. And the other stuff hasn't been affected, uh, the paleosome. There are lots of examples of, of migmatites at various scales. Sometimes it can be hard to tell what's, what is a migmatite, what rock has been partially melted, and what hasn't, what are just dikes coming from another place. So a good principle to remember is the smaller the dike is, the closer its source has to be. So if we have really tiny little dikes running through, then we know the source has to be really close. And so if you see tiny little dikes, then that's, that's nearly a guarantee that, um, that the rock is a migmatite. Other examples with these tiny dikes really um, are nearly sure that this is a migmatite. So you could leucosomes and melanosomes here. The amphibolite that we found also shows good evidence for leucosomes, small little dikes, and melanosomes that the, the rock rich in amphibole, or hornblende, is what, uh, is what is being left behind by the mill. More evidence of this is seen in photomicrographs under the microscope. Here we could be seeing a transitional a transitional phase where we have lots, the green and browns are amphiboles, the lighter colors are K-Feld spars, there, there are some little quartz grains too. So this could be as ev evidence, restitic fabric means um, what's being pulled out of the melt. We, here we have good evidence of melt extraction, that the, the more felsic materials are being melted away, and eventually it will turn into something like this. This is over 90% amphibole, the blues and browns. Um, and the odd thing is we do see a little bit, the small little light colored grains are quartz in them. And normally when you think of amphibolite as a metamorphic rock, you see amphibole and plagioclase. Here we don't have any plagioclase, we just have amphibole and quartz, which gives evidence that, that this is coming from a non-mafic protolith that this is a more felsic or intermediate composition, lower temperature rock that's, um, that the, that's go undergoing melt extraction, that the more felsic stuff is being pulled out of it. Uh, possible metamorphic conditions. We have, it's evident that we have high grade metamorphism because we have lots of migmatites and because of the minerals. Here's a, here's a chart of aluminosilicates, uh, minerals with aluminum and silica and the pressure and temperature conditions that they form in. We, and here's another important line on this. Uh, past this temperature, we have garnet, K feldspar, and liquid, and below we have biotite and selenite. So in these rocks, we have the black minerals, are garnet, and lots of K feldspar. In order to even get particularly this garnet, we need to be past this line in this condition. So we see evidence for prograde, increasing temperature metamorphism. We also, however, have selimonite. Those are the bladed, brightly colored, high birefringent minerals. Um, when, it's, when it's really fibrous, it's known as fiberlite. Um, so we have selimonite in the rocks, and we also see garnets being stretched out and resorbed. The garnets are being destroyed. Um, you can see this particularly well in thin sections. The, these, are, these three are plain polarized light. This is cross polarized light. It's black in the cross polarized and gray in the plain polarized. You can see it's being stretched out, covered with inclusions with, um, with quartz, with the 
you know, white quartz and brown biotite, they're being destroyed. And this is, this is evidence that on our line here, we are going the opposite direction. We're, we're seeing preserved retrograde metamorphism. Here's, here's another K feldspar porphyroclast that's being overtaken by these little fibrous selenite. So we're changing these garnet and K feldspar are being destroyed and changed into biotite, the brown, and selenite, the fibrous. They're seeing both prograde and retrograde metamorphism preserved in these rocks. Uh, the final thing that we see in some of the areas uh, is a metasomatic due to hydrothermal fluids, low temperature metamorphism known as SCARN. It's characterized by grossular or green garnets and pyroxenes. Um, I'm not sure entirely how pervasive this is or what, uh, what time it happened, but it is there in the rock. So, those are my findings. Any questions? The leucogranites, you didn't, you didn't talk about the stage in which the leucogranites, are the leucogranites from the magmatites? It's, it's unclear. We see some leucogranites in magmatites and some that are larger dikes. So there needs to be a lot more investigation into what, which are the migmatites and which aren't. Are the leucogranites as deformed as the migmatites? No, not usually. <laughs>